Please open in your Bibles to Romans, Romans chapter 11. And if you stand, I'll be reading verses uh, 25 through the end of the chapter of Romans 11 as we continue on in our series, our distinctives of grace, and as we are continuing now in our series on the coming of Christ. And we'll today be discussing the nature of the church in Israel, God's promises to us, and the fact that he is faithful to fulfill those things that he has promised. What a joy. So follow with me as I read Romans 11, verses 25 through 46. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience. So these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they may also now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or become his counselor? Who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Now this passage that I've read speaks of a restoration of the nation of Israel which is based on the faithfulness of God to fulfill every promise that he has ever made. And we live in a world where no one fulfills their promises. In fact, when our leaders speak to us today, we expect them to be lying. And we simply try to predict what they might actually do without paying any attention to their words at all. Our media has become the same. We assume in most cases rightly that a bias will turn the news into a mishmash of politicized opinions which has very little relationship to the truth. But thankfully, we have a God who is the embodiment of truth. And when he speaks, he is always truthful. When he makes promises, he always fulfills them. When he declares loyalties, he always supports them. God has made thousands of specific promises to believers in his word. And he will make them good. He's made hundreds of prophetic pronouncements in the Bible. And he will fulfill every single one. These promises and pronouncements include specific words to the people and nation of Israel, and he will fulfill them all. We see all throughout Scripture, we see everything about God's character and nature, that he is faithful to his promises. And what we'll see this morning particularly is that God's plan for the end of time, eschatology, includes specific promises and prophecies concerning the nation of Israel, and he will fulfill every one of them. Again, God's plan for the end of time includes specific promises promises and prophecies concerning the nation of Israel, and he will fulfill every one of them. God is faithful to his promises. Remember that we are working our way through distinctives. We, talked, we have talked about the role of elders, talked about the role of the Holy Spirit, talked about the, the nature of, of the church, uh, the way that we worship, and we'll, we'll actually be continuing and finishing our eschatology on, or our distinctives as we, as we consider the nature of worship, and next week we'll begin that. Right? And, and we've been spending these last weeks on what we have called premillennial eschatology. Remember, eschatology is simply the doctrine of the last things. Premillennial is the fact that we live in a time before the return of Christ to set up his literal kingdom on earth for a thousand years. Remember what we know for sure. That's where we begin. Christ will personally return to earth. His return is imminent. We are to expect him at any moment. He will rapture and resurrect his saints. Every man will be bodily raised from the dead. There are two resurrections, one unto life and one unto eternal death. Christ will set up his kingdom and rule and reign. And he will set it up here on this earth to begin with and then move into the eternal state. Every person will be judged. Every person will enter into an eternal state. That is believers to eternal intimacy with God in heaven and unbelievers to eternal punishment in hell. And then we talked about the return of Christ. What do we know for sure? 
The nature of it is sudden, personal, visible, bodily. We just, uh, Ron just read you that passage this morning from Acts chapter 1 as I stare up into the sky and the angels say, He's coming. Don't stand, don't stand staring into the sky. You've got work to do. He's coming back. Prepare for that time. We are to have a vigilant expectation, hopeful expectation, eager expectation, and a holy expectation for the return of Christ. He's coming for his bride. We want to be his holy, pure people as he comes. And we talked about the timing of Christ's return. It is unknown. That is, no man knows the day or the hour. And yet, as, as we mentioned, it is that which is to be expected at every moment. Unknown for any certain moment. Expected at every moment. Well, then we discussed last week what we know about the coming kingdom of Christ. And remember that our understanding of the kingdom is a matter of a literal, grammatical, historical, contextual hermeneutic. That is simply a a means of studying the Bible, which takes its grammar, its history, the structure of the Bible, and the context of the Bible all seriously. That hermeneutic allows us to know everything that we know for sure about the return of Christ. And therefore, we simply follow that same hermeneutic to understand what he will do in his kingdom, what the Bible has to say about his coming kingdom. So a consistent application of that hermeneutic leads to the following truths about the kingdom of Christ that we discussed last week. This present age will continue for an unknown period of time. There will be a great tribulation near the end of time. There will be a rapture of the saints in which living believers will instantly receive new bodies and the bodies of dead believers will be glorified and reunited with their souls. Christ will return bodily to the earth at the end of the great tribulation. Satan will be bound and cast into the bottomless pit. Christ will set up his millennial or thousand-year reign upon the earth. At the end of that thousand years, Satan will be released from the pit, will gather rebellious people for a battle against Jesus, and Christ will defeat Satan for the final time, casting him into the lake of fire along with the beast and the false prophet who are already there. The unbelieving dead will then be raised and have their bodies reunited with their souls. The great white throne judgment will occur. Unbelievers will be cast bodily into the lake of fire to be, to be punished there forever. And believers will enter into the eternal state of the new heavens and new earth. Oh, wow. That's exciting stuff. That's what the Bible teaches us. Those things are sure. Those things will happen. This is what the Bible says. And so we love to, to think about it, to consider, and to rejoice in these things because it is our hope. Our hope is to be fixed where? Completely on the revelation or or on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revealing of Christ. There's nothing here in this world is worth the fullness of our hope. We have other things we hope for, but nothing is sure as the hope of the return of Christ. Now, our millennial distinctive, our premillennial distinctive on the website, if you have read it, We've really covered two pieces of it. The first part, at Jesus' second coming, he will set up an earthly kingdom over which he will reign for a thousand years. The third part of that distinctive is at the end of the thousand years, Satan will be released to deceive the nations, final battle, great white throne judgment, and the eternal state is ushered in. But there is a second piece of that millennial distinctive that we haven't covered yet, and that is that in the millennium, a a restored nation of believing Israelites will be the lead nation of that earthly kingdom with Gentile believers and believing Jews reigning along with Jesus Christ. And so it's important that we cover that piece as well so that you understand why it is that we hold distinctions or a distinction between Israel and the church for certain things that God has promised to them. This further refinement is not something that is is invented or, or that we draw simply from a theological system The further refinement of eschatology is drawn directly from our text. We're going to spend a lot of time reading places in the Bible that you probably don't read a lot. We're going to read Zechariah. We're going to read all kinds of places where these things are predicted, these truths about God's plan for the nation of Israel. The millennium, Christ's kingdom on earth and the tribulation, cannot be clearly understood outside of God's remaining purposes and promises to his ethnic people Israel. They make no sense. To have a millennium, to have a tribulation, when, if God is not working with Israel, doesn't match the rest of the Bible. Those two things do not fit together. So, let's jump quickly. You're not going to be quite on your outline yet, but we'll work our way that way. First, I'm going to give you an overview. So I guess that's your, your first point. An overview of reasons for biblical distinctions between Israel and the church. The question should be, why do we have a further distinction within this premillennial position? And the reason is that the same hermeneutic and understanding of biblical interpretation that led to a premillennial position leads to an ongoing differentiation between the church and the ethnic nation of Israel. 
This enables the consistent application of a literal, grammatical, historical, contextual hermeneutic. Holding a, a distinction between Israel and the church allows us to interpret the Old Testament promises to Israel as actual promises to the nation of Israel, which is exactly what those Israelites would have understood. It allows us to take the Old Testament seriously. And I might stop for just a moment here and you're like, wow, you know, I just showed up this morning and, and you're doing premillennial eschatology and the distinctions between Israel and the church. These things matter. They matter because they inform our ability to properly understand Scripture through a proper interpretation of it. These are important matters because they, they form the foundation of our church, or at least the, the way that we come to these conclusions is being, being revealed through the very way that we study Scripture. So all of these things flow out into these important doctrinal distinctions. Having a distinction or seeing the distinction between Israel and the church allows us to make sense of prophecy which speaks of God's plan for Israel and Jerusalem and Jews after the ascension of Christ back to heaven. Christ did not subsume Israel. Israel was not simply fulfilled in the person of Christ and then there are no literal fulfillments after that. He laid the foundation for all of the literal fulfillments to Israel which will come. This also allows us to trust God when he makes promises to a particular group of people, i.e. Israel, that he will not renounce or change those promises in any way, but that he will fulfill them. God is always faithful to the things that he's promised. And if he's not faithful to Israel, we have absolutely no confidence that he would be faithful to us. Our promises are bound together completely. They're, they're interwoven completely with the promises to Israel. And so if he does not fulfill those, there is no assurance that he will fulfill ours. God does not have two separate plans. One single plan that includes clear distinctions between Israel and the church, even while maintaining their continuity as one people of God. And scripture interweaves these from beginning to end. And that's the beauty of it. The beauty of this position, the beauty of this means of studying scripture, is it allows us to take everything, as it were, at face value, just as it is in our text working through metaphor when it's metaphor, working through illustration when it's illustration, preparing the way for seeing all the things that God is doing to the fullest extent that we can understand them. And please know that we're not saying we have every bit of this figured out. We're teaching the things that we feel like are the most clear that Scripture reveals. So, secondly now, God began. So, now what we're going to do is I'm going to give you in... 20 minutes, 25 minutes, I'm going to give you an overview of God's redemptive plan as it relates to Israel and the church and the culmination for both. 20 minutes. All right, we're going to do our best. I'm parachuting in on a lot of passages here that if you come and do some of the other, take some of the other uh, Sunday school classes and, 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 and programs that we offer, ministers who offer, it will help you. A little side note, our Shepherd's Institute class for men, where a two-year program where we begin by studying the, an overview of Old Testament and New Testament, work our way to, to uh, uh, systematic theology and then how to study scripture, hermeneutics, and, and then work our way out through leadership and counseling. That's coming. We're going to begin that in the fall. And so if you sit here this morning going, I don't know what you're talking about. Great, men. Well, not great, maybe, but come join us in the fall and we'll help fill this in so you know. All right, our ladies do the same. They do similar class. It won't start in the fall, probably another year before that specific class happens. Oh, but by the way, you can study these things on your own at any time. Feel free to do so. I'm going to give you an overview. We'll do the best that we can. So here we go. God began his redemptive work with a promise concerning a redeemer. This is clear. Genesis 3.15. And the redeemer would be the seed of the woman. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Speaking of the serpent. Between your seed and her seed, he will bruise you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel. We have the promise through the seed of Eve of a coming Messiah who will bruise or, or really who will crush the serpent's head. This then begins to carry itself out. God carries forth his redemptive work by choosing an individual, Abraham, to form an ethnic people, the Israelites. Turn to Genesis 12. We're going to do some Bible drills this morning, so be ready to use, use your fingers or uh, and either to turn pages or to swipe on your phone, either way, or your iPad. Genesis chapter 12 is a promise then to Abraham as he calls him out to form his nation, Israel. Genesis 12, verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, I will make your name, name great, and you shall be a blessing. 
And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This Abrahamic covenant, and really we can see the Bible as a series of covenants, as a a series of promises that God makes to his people. Promises in which he makes. He, He says, this is what I will do. Right? And in the Abrahamic covenant, we see a promise of a land that uh, Abraham will enter into and then have perpetually for the nation that will come from him a land, a seed that f- coming forth from him will be a son, and then ultimately that his, his descendants will be as, as the stars uh, in the sky, as the sand on the seashore. And we see a blessing, that is the blessings to Abraham and through his seed, and ultimately through the seed that will come the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, there will be a blessing that extends to all the nations. Please understand that in the Abrahamic covenant, you have the, both the promises to Israel and the promises to the Gentiles and to the church. It is bound up in that covenant. And that covenant is a unilateral covenant, unconditional and everlasting. That is, God makes it. And although Abraham has things that he, to which he is supposed to respond, his response is not what drives the covenant. God says, I will do this, and it is an everlasting covenant. So please understand that the, the Abrahamic covenant lays the groundwork for both Israel and the church, even though, as we will see, the church remained a mystery and, and something that was unrevealed in its fullness until we get to the New Testament. So both are bound up there. But this unconditional and everlasting covenant is made clear. It's reiterated in Genesis 17. So turn there. Genesis chapter 17, verse 7. God comes to Abraham again. He says, I will establish my covenant between me and your descendants. This is verse 7 of chapter 17. Between me and your descendants, after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. It could not be any more clear. This is an everlasting covenant. All the pieces of the covenant are everlasting, the land, the seed, and the blessing. Psalm 105, verse 8. He has remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham, his oath to Isaac, that he confirmed to Jacob for a statue, to Israel an everlasting covenant saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion of your inheritance. So God made promises, chose Abraham and made promises to him, and God made promises to Israel as a nation. This is still underneath your second or, or point C, letter C there. Right? God made promises to Israel as a nation, That is, after he made promises to Abraham, then as that nation gets established, promises are made to them. Israel is not a type. Neither Christ nor the church assume her identity. The church is part of the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant as the blessings of Abraham are extended to the Gentile nations in the New Testament era. Turn to Jeremiah 31. This is an everlasting relationship could not be more clear all throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament as well. So as we move to the major prophets, and particularly to the book of Jeremiah at the end, right, and really, again, all throughout the, both the major and minor prophets, in Jeremiah 31, we have this, the, the concept of this everlasting promise made to the nation itself. Jeremiah 31, 35 through 37. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and a fixed order of the moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. You can just end there. All right, if, if you stop having the sun rising and setting, if you stop having seasons, if, if, if the earth disappears, then Israel would somehow cease being a nation. Verse 37, thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured, if the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. I will never cast them out, says the Lord. If, we, if you could figure out everything in the universe and become like God, then there would be a chance that somehow God would forsake his promises to his ethnic people. Certainly they would have understood that this was a promise to them as a nation. Jeremiah 33. We'll be back in Jeremiah 31 in a minute, but Jeremiah 33 verse 14. Again reiterates this point. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth. He shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. 
In those days, Judah will be saved. Jerusalem will dwell in safety. And this is the name by which she will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. These are promises that are made. Specific mentions, Jerusalem and Judah, to the nation of Israel itself, that God would be faithful to them. And in case, there certainly have been doubters all down throughout the ages. Well, God is not faithful to his nation. When Israel was not a nation for the many years uh, uh, after the coming of Christ and after the return of Christ uh, to heaven, right? Israel was a nation for a while. Then after 70 AD, they get obliterated again. And then they spend all of those years, thousands of years, no longer as a nation. Certainly many scoffers came and said, this can't be true. In fact, that's a lot of uh, that whole idea is where a lot of our amillennial theology comes from, that somehow God has set aside Israel because they weren't a nation, almost driven by history rather than scripture. And then what, what stunning thing happens in, in 1945, Israel becomes a nation again. Now, that nation could disappear, and if it did, the promise would not disappear. God would again restore a nation. So it might not be the final one, but God has always kept his people. And there's all, there have always been scoffers that say, that's not true. God has no promises for his people. He's, he's, he's let his people go. They're, his ethnic people don't matter. Jeremiah 33, verse 24. Have you not observed what this people have spoken, saying? The two families which the Lord chose, he's rejected them. These people were saying, he's rejected his nation. He's going to take them off into exile. Jeremiah predicted that. So he's rejected them entirely. That means that he has, he has done with them. But he goes on to say this. Thus they, are dis- thus they despise my people. No longer are they as a nation in their sight. You see it? It's been, this happened all throughout time. Oh, Jews done. Israel done. Nothing left to do with them. He says the people have been doing that since, since the beginning. Thus says the Lord, if my covenant for day and night stand not, if the fixed patterns of heaven and earth I have not established, then I would reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, not taking from his descendants rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I will restore their fortunes and will have mercy on them. And by the way, he's not speaking of the rest of the first restoration after the 70-year captivity. We know that very clearly from the latter prophets, the post-exilic prophets, that even after that return to the land, after the 70-year captivity, that there, he says that's not the final restoration. The Davidic king has not arrived you, have not, you are not yet in your fullness in that restoration. So even the promises here in Jeremiah await a future fulfillment. They were not fulfilled when they returned to the land after their Babylonian captivity. Well, then back to Jeremiah 31. So in these promises to his nation, he, he promised an everlasting relationship, and then he promised a new covenant. By the way, the new covenant, this is, and, and many people misunderstand this, the new covenant is not replacing the Abrahamic covenant, Right? The new covenant replaces the Mosaic covenant. That is the old covenant of law, which was not an eternal covenant. And it was a covenant with an end when Jesus would come. No, the new covenant comes underneath the Abrahamic covenant as the means of extending the blessings to the nations. So the Mosaic covenant, done. But when the new covenant is promised, it does not undo the Abrahamic covenant, which is the grounding for the rest of the covenants that flow out through the Old and New Testaments and early into the eternal state. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Again, replacing the old or Mosaic covenant. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. You see it. That's the Mosaic. Not the promise he made to Abraham in Genesis 12. He's not abrogating that ever. It will never be abrogated. It cannot be. Although the Mosaic covenant is done. It was done with Christ. Not like the covenant, verse 32, which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them on their heart, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall not teach again each man his neighbor, each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And then then again, we just read where he says that's eternal. That's going to be something that is everlasting. Well, next, letter D here, God continued his redemptive work by establishing the church. So he makes these promises to Israel in the Old Testament. Promises which are made as ever, an everlasting covenant, which was, was a covenant that was uh, not dependent upon Abraham's actions, but was dependent upon God's to make it eternal. Then as we move into the New Testament, he continues his redemptive work by establishing a church, 
a new people consisting of both Israelite and Gentile. And number one here is that the church does not replace, supersede, or fulfill the nation of Israel. It is a new thing, a new entity. Again, not new in that God didn't know it was coming, not new in that it was like plan B when Israel didn't do what they were supposed to, new in that it is not the same as Israel. It's not just a continuation through some kind of fulfillment. The church is a new thing, again, predicted in the old, but in a, a, what we call a mystery form. That is a form that wasn't recognizable until Christ came. The church is anticipated in the Old Testament. It is spoken of in the New Testament as a mystery. The church does not fulfill Israel, but is the fulfillment of the prediction that Israel would be a blessing to the nations by bringing the Messiah. It continues the Abrahamic covenant. And the New Testament writers did not see the church replacing Israel. Now, again, there is much language that is used of the church that is covenantal kinds of, of language, language, and language that sounds like promises made to Israel. But that does not mean, and, and as we'll see in just a moment, it is not the fact that, that then the church has then replaced Israel because we get to come underneath all the kinds of covenantal blessings that Israel had. The fact that we become a beneficiary, as we will see in, uh, of the new covenant, does not mean that somehow we've replaced Israel under the new covenant. And so when you see that kind of language in the New Testament, you just rejoice in it. Wow, the church is the chosen people of God. The church is a, is a, is a new nation, as it were. Those are wonderful things, but it has nothing to do with replacing what God has planned for his people. It is just covenantal language used of us, which is a tremendous blessing to us. Now, uh, the idea that the New Testament writers didn't see the church replacing Israel is abundantly clear. Of the 73 uses, usages of the word Israel in the New Testament, all refer to ethnic Israel. There's actually only one of those that is disputed, Genesis 6.16, talking about an Israel of God. And even there, it seems incredibly clear if you read that. The Israel of God is or were Jews within the church. Still Israel, ethnic Jews that were at that time within the church. Christ stated that the disciples would rule over Israel. Israel, Matthew 19, 28. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, you have followed me in the regeneration, millennial kingdom, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also will sit upon 12 thrones, judging who? The 12 tribes of Israel. Is Jesus making things up? Is Jesus forgetting who's, who's actually ruling? They're, gonna, they're going to rule over a nation of Israel. The disciples believed the kingdom would be restored to Israel. Ron read that, Acts 1. When they'd come together, they were asking him. Because this is after spending their time with Jesus for three years, and then Jesus correcting their theology continually about the kingdom for 40 days. It says he spoke for them for 40 days after his ascension about the kingdom. And here's the question that they ask right before he goes back to be with the Father. He says, so when they came together, they were asking him, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, if he'd been telling them over and over and over, there is no kingdom to Israel, there is no kingdom to Israel, I am now Israel, the church is now Israel, Israel is gone, why would they ask that question? And if they did ask that question and he'd been telling them that, what would the answer be? You still don't get it. There is no kingdom for Israel. Give up your kingdom for Israel thoughts. I've raised from the dead. I've solved all of those. I've, I've, I'm the fulfillment of all of those promises to Israel. There are no more promises and there is no kingdom to Israel itself. But what does he actually say? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or epics. Implication. It's coming. I'm just not telling you when. Go do your work. That's what he told them. He didn't say it's not happening, not coming. Go, go, go do your work. I'll bring the kingdom for Israel when I desire. Peter spoke of the distinction between Israel and the Gentiles after Christ's ascension. This is fascinating. Turn to Acts chapter 3. Often overlooked. Because again, most will say, many will say that when Jesus came... After his resurrection from the dead, there are no more literal promises left to the nation of Israel. There's no more addressing of Israel as Israel. It's only just the church. Peter himself, in his first sermon, or his second sermon, makes it very clear that, there, that he is addressing an ethnic Israel that still exists and still is being appealed to. This is fascinating. Genesis 3.24, as he finishes up his sermon, he says, likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. That's a time of restoration, verse 21. He says, Jesus will go back to heaven. I should, I should read that to you. He's telling this audience in his second sermon, repent and return. So verse 19, that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come to you from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus. Because remember, Jesus ascended at this point. 
He may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. Peter says, look, there's all kinds of prophecies that remain. You need to bend the knee to Christ so that when he returns, you will be on the, the blessing side of those promises. And you go, well, who is he talking to? Uh, you know, just a, now a, a group of people that no longer have any ethnic distinction, no longer uh, any, any appeal to the Jews or to Jews as a, as a nation? No, look at verse 25. It is you, because he's speaking in Jerusalem. It is you, you all, who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenants which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. What does Jesus do? He re- reiterates the Abrahamic covenant, Peter, reiterates the Abrahamic covenant here as they're pressing on into the New Testament and the church era. He says God is going to do that. And God is going to answer everything he gave to his people. And I'm speaking to you, Jews, he was, Peter was, and you need to wake up because you're still the people of the covenant. You're the people of whom or to whom he made that covenant and he's addressing you first. And you need to respond. He says, verse 26, for you first... God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. And Israel rejected him. He's still appealing to them in this second sermon. And they continue to reject. Paul consistently spoke of a burden for his ethnic people. That is, in his evangelism, he recognized an ethnic distinction. That is, there were still Jews and still Gentiles. And even as Jews and Gentiles were coming into the church, Paul was concerned for his ethnic people that they would return. Christ's coming did not eliminate these ethnic distinctions, just folding them up into the church. Romans 9, 1. You can turn there. It's right back at, past Acts, Romans 9. We'll be, in, we'll be in Romans for a moment. Paul says, I'm telling you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. Verse 1 of 9. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren. Who are these brethren? My kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. There still remains this ethnic distinction in Paul's mind as you press forward into the New Testament era. Look what he says about them. To whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory. This is all present tense. To whom belongs, not belonged, and it got set aside and and the church fulfilled it. To whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. Whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is over all God bless forever. Amen. It could not be more clear. Paul sees an ongoing role and distinction for Israel seeing them still as the people of God to whom God made certain promises that he will fulfill. Romans 11 makes it even more clear. Look at verse 1. It's fascinating in the book of Romans after you have this great presentation of the gospel and you have justification by faith and sanctification and, and, the, and the fact that all, both Jews and Gentiles, are equally condemned and Jews and Gentiles have equal opportunity to come to Christ. It's almost as though at Romans 9, Paul goes, well, wait a minute, I need to deal with something. And that is the question raised in the minds of the Jews particularly, well, what about all those promises to Israel? If both Jews and Gentiles are equal now in Christ, why are there, or is there, has God abandoned all of the things he said in the Old Testament? As he said, look, I'm not doing that anymore. Paul spends three chapters laboring to demonstrate that this is not the case. That Israel has not been set aside as a nation, that God's promises to them will be fulfilled. And again, it's, it's incredibly clear. Romans 11.1 says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? I mean, there's the answer. God's rejected Israel. They're done. They're assumed in the church. Christ is Israel. All of those things. Paul answers that question without any, I mean, it could, how could it be more clear? God has not rejected his people. Who are these people? May it never be. I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Couldn't be any more clear. Rest of Romans 11 proves that fact. Paul specifically warned Gentiles against being arrogant towards Israel, thinking that they had replaced Israel completely. That's the one thing he warns them about in Romans 11. Don't think that you as Gentiles or the church have somehow replaced Israel completely. It's arrogance. He says this in Romans 11, verse 17. Drop your eyes down. I say then, they, Israel... Did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. That is, they did not stumble in rejecting Christ in such a way that God then says, I reject you, or those promises to you I will not fulfill. He says, may it never be. There could not be any stronger 
uh, language to say that could never happen. But by their transgression, that is the Jews in rejecting their Messiah. Salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. That is, the Gentiles now have salvation, and so the Jews will be drawn back towards Christ because of that. Now, if their transgression is the riches of the world and their failure is the riches of the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? That's 11 and 12. And then jump to verse 17. For if some of the branches were broken off, that is the Jews, and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and have become partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, verse 18, do not be arrogant towards the branches. Don't look back and say, well, yeah, God set you aside. He put us in. You're done. As though we could say that. We are to continue to have a respect for and honor for the Jewish nature of the faith because it began with the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's exactly what Paul points to over and over in Romans 11. No arrogance by the church towards Israel because Israel somehow set aside, uh, did in fact reject their Messiah. By the way, if people had read Romans 11 well, this would have led to a, a tremendous blessing for the Jews because it was the church from the time of Augustine onwards, who were the primary persecutors of the Jews, the church, because they misunderstood this entire concept and somehow felt like that since God had set aside the Jewish people and they were no longer God's people at all and they were the ones who had crucified as an ethnic people and rejected Christ, that they could be, with, with biblical warrant, they could be harmed and persecuted and crushed. It's a travesty. It was that theology largely that drove the, the anti-Semitism that came from the church, not from the outside world. Paul says he's specifically warning against that kind of attitude here. Don't do that. They remain a precious people to God, even though they've been broken off for a time. Guys, you've got to read your Bibles well. You end up in real trouble. And you begin to see why these things become important. Whole whole. Epics of our history have been harmed by a misunderstanding of Israel and the church. It matters, and it matters today. The book of Revelation mentions the nation of Israel as being an integral part of the tribulation in Revelation 7.4. I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. I read an interesting blog post the other day by a guy I really respect, but the whole thing was why the 144,000 are not from Israel. And I'm going, it says the tribe of the sons of Israel. There's no other place in the Bible, no, no, no other New Testament passages that, repl- that replaces Israel with the church. Why here? How could it possibly be here? It's not. And so it's, you guys got to explain away the word. can't be Israel. It says it's Israel. So let's go with that. That seems, seems wise to me because the Apostle Paul said it's Israel. Jesus said it's Israel. Peter said it's Israel. The Old Testament prophet said it's Israel. It means his ethnic people. It always means that. And so it means that here. Number two, then, the church is a new entity consisting of Israelites and Gentiles together. Ephesians 2, turn there. Right, and even now we move to warp speed. You think we've been going fast up to this point. All right, Ephesians, we've got to work our way through this uh, to get as close as we can. So in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 13, Now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now stay with me. So that he himself, Christ, might make the two, that is really Jews and Gentiles, into one new man, not Israel redone, not Israel fulfilled, not Israel now in the church, a new man. It's something new. The church is a new entity, not Israel. It's made up now of Jews and Gentiles together, and it will then enter as the people of God into the millennial state along with the renewed nation of Israel, that is, those whom God has brought to himself, a massive revival at the end of time in which ethnic Jews then enter. They are, through individual salvation, they come to know Christ and enter into that eternal state and into the millennial kingdom. It says, so at the end, he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, having put to death the enmity, the two into one new man. And so therefore the church is part of the new covenant as well. Now that's a fascinating thing. Turn to Hebrews 7. Because this has confused many. Like, well, Israel had the new covenant. And Hebrews seems to indicate that now the new covenant is for the church. So therefore the church has replaced Israel. It couldn't be further from the truth. All God has done is brought the church underneath that new covenant that he also promised to Israel. Here's the, here's the amazing part 
The flip that God so often does, the, the switcheroo that he does, we, the church, get the new covenant first. The nation of Israel will receive it when they return to Christ in the tribulation. We'll see that in just a moment. But those promises of the new covenant, which comes underneath the Abrahamic covenant, all come first to the church because Christ is the mediator. And now the church is the one that he is working with, and so Christ is mediating those blessings of the new covenant to the church even before the nation of Israel receives them. Hebrews 7.22. So much more also Jesus has now become the guarantor of a better covenant. And by the way, a better covenant than the Mosaic covenant, not a better covenant than the Abrahamic covenant. The former priests on the one end exercised in great numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I don't have time this morning, but Hebrews 8 then lays out, the, it, it ties that promise of a new covenant directly back to Jeremiah 31 that we just read. It says that was given to Israel, but amazing thought, church, because Christ is the mediator, you can only mediate one covenant now, that is the new covenant which flows out of the old. You, church, get the blessings and benefits of what was promised to Israel under a new covenant before they even get it. Wow. Number four, Israel suffered then a partial hardening in order for the church to actually be established. This was God's plan. And hear me very carefully. That did not mean then, does not mean, again, some say, some say well, the church is a parenthesis. The only thing that means is that in the Old Testament, the, the Jewish prophets were looking at the nation of Israel. They saw Christ's first coming for, to, to provide for Israel. And then they saw his second coming to, to provide for Israel. And they didn't make a lot of predictions about what happened in between, which is the church age. But it has nothing to do with being some kind of parenthesis that God didn't think about. Oh, we're, we're kind of a second plan. No, we are a, a part of, in fact, the very reason that Israel was set aside is so the church could be brought in. It couldn't be anything further from a double plan or a parenthesis plan or something that God didn't speak about. Look at Romans 11 again. And I already read these passages. So back to Romans 11, verse 25. I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery because in the Old Testament it wasn't clearly seen. Not, not, not predicted at all. Not totally unknown in the Old Testament, just a mystery. I do not want you to, brethren, be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The church now coming. So, here's what it says. And so all Israel, ethnic Israel, will be saved. That is through individual salvation God will work and so there will be a national revival and renewal. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Wait a minute, he already did that. Certainly he did that. But Israel has not responded to that. They rejected him, but they will respond to that and the deliverer then at that point will be for them as it were. It says, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. From the standpoint, listen, from the standpoint of God's choice, they, ethnic Israel, are beloved for the sake of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were Israelites. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. He has called his nation. He will fulfill his promises to his nation. He will restore his nation, and they will enter with the church into the millennium and into the eternal state. Zechariah also predicts this salvation, Zechariah 12, 9. And that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David and on the house, inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. So they will look on me whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him, that is the Messiah, as one mourns for an only son. They will weep bitterly over him like a bitter weeping of the firstborn. Zechariah is a post-exilic prophet. He speaks after the restoration of Israel back to the land after their 70-year captivity. He looks ahead to say there's a coming millennial time, a tribulation time, in which when the Messiah returns at that point, the second coming, Israel will be prepared. They will see their Messiah whom they pierced, and they will repent in mass. Thus all Israel will be saved. There will be a massive re revival and response from the nation of Israel to Israel. God. This is clearly predicted. We're not inventing things. We're not, you know, it's not murky things that are unsure. It couldn't be more clear from Romans 11, certainly, but from, from multiple Old Testament passages. The Israelites then will receive the blessings of the new covenant at that time. The covenant predicted to them, they will receive it as a nation. And by the way, that's a major part of what the millennial kingdom is for. All those blessings will then flow into the millennial kingdom. The Israelites will receive the fullness of the land that they were promised. And this will happen in the millennium. 
the Israelites will finally, inf- will finally fulfill the mandate to be a blessing to the rest of the nations by ruling with Christ in Jerusalem. And this happens in the millennium, Zechariah 14. At the end of Zechariah 14, verse 19, it says, and, all, and in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, a real Jerusalem, the actual Jerusalem, a physical Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea, the other half towards the western sea. It will be in summer as it was in winter. The Lord will reign over all the earth, and in that day, the Lord will be the only one, and his name will be the only one. He will rule. He will rule from Jerusalem. He will rule with his ethnic people as well as with the church of God as one people of God. Last point. God will harmonize his redemptive work by having the restored nation of Israel rule and reign with the church as one people of God. Israel will retain ethnic identity as she brings a blessing to the nations. Zechariah 8. Thus says the Lord, it will yet be that peoples will come, even the inhabitants of other cities. This is in the millennial kingdom. The inhabitants will of one will go to the other saying, let us go once more to entreat the favor of the Lord, to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go. So many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. Again, physical location, to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, ten men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, an Israelite, saying, let us go with you, for we've heard that God will be with you. So that the Jews, as a nation, uh, uh, the, the, as it were, the lead nation, ruling from Jerusalem with Christ, but also Revelation 2, the promise to the church, that he who overcomes and keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. So we, the church, will also be ruling and reigning with them. The nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem will retain geographic significance. I've read verse after verse. Actual Israel, actual Jerusalem, a, a, a piece of land on an earth where Christ comes to rule. All of God's people will rule and reign together then into the eternal state through the millennium, even there in the eternal state, retaining their ethnic identity. And well, how do you know that? Turn lastly to Revelation 21. It, it just is absolutely fascinating to me. At the very end of the story, after we have a new heavens and a new earth, even here, the Bible makes clear that there remains a distinction and, and, and an identification of ethnic Israel, Revelation 21.10. And he carried me away to a great and to a high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of the heavens from God. This is a new Jerusalem. It's not the same as the old one in the millennial kingdom, but now we get a new one. And by the way, it's still called Jerusalem. That's interesting. It relates it directly to all of the ethnicity that's bound up in Israel. Having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall, 12 gates, and on the gates were 12 angels, and the names were written on them, and the names, and which are the names of what? The 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. You think, well, maybe, maybe, maybe here, Israel now means the church. No, keep reading. On the gates, on the east, and three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of whom? The apostles of the Lamb, those who started the church. Even here, in the eternal states, you have this eternal distinction, God always loving his ethnic people, God bringing in his church, both of them operating together for all of eternity. God always keeps his promises. Why do we emphasize this? Because you as a church ought to love this. You ought to be able to read your Bible and say, that's Israel, I know, what that, I, I, know what, I know what that is. And as I see Israel, I track it through, I see God's work for them. I applaud and, and, and rejoice in God's work and I prepare for it and pray for it. And it all, yet I also see God's work in the church and I love the promises that he's made to us and because he's going to fulfill his promises to them, I'm confident that he'll fulfill his promises to me and he's going to match us all together at the end so that we might accomplish his work. This is beautiful. It's the nature of the promise he's made. Now, we, we celebrate this morning another promise, don't we? The promise of salvation. The promise that Jesus would forgive us and save us from our sins. What confidence do we have of this promise if God does not fulfill the promises that he made in Genesis? It's all built together. And so you come together, to, we come together today with absolute confidence. And when God says he will wash away your sins, when he, he will take your garments and make them white as snow, when he will replace your sin with the righteousness of Christ on the basis of the justification that he provides through faith, that that promise is real. 
And we celebrate it this morning. So if the men would come forward.